Hey, welcome to the Vibe Church Podcast. I am so glad that you found us. I trust that what God brings into your life today through this word is going to bless you, expand you, and grow you as a result. I pray that God equips you. I pray that God mobilizes you after hearing this word. Enjoy. Amen. Amen. Hey, 2024, you made it. This is a significant year for Kira and I. This year marks uh, 20 years of ministry for us. We were, we were one year married when we became youth pastors at the church that we were at. And, uh, and it was a great day. Actually, before that, our first ministry assignment, before we were ordained ministers, before we were youth pastors, we were group leaders, believe it or not. And it's funny that it's Group Sunday. What a great assignment it is for a budding minister to lead a group. And uh, we had just gotten married at the time, and we had a brand new house. And we had decided in the process of getting the house, in the prayer process of getting the house, we said, God, if you give us this house, we will make this house a second home of Jesus. We will entertain people. We will host people. We will open our doors. And sure enough, we got the house. So we said, let's do it. So we opened our house, and we started a group. We signed up at our church, and we listed a group. And um and it was interesting because I'd, I prepared a discussion for the group. Kira prepared the snacks, uh, but no one turned up. And that was awkward. However, we still ate the snacks, and um, I did my discussion. <laughs> I said, all right, babe, get ready. <laughs> week two came around. I said, surely, you know, we advertised it for two weeks in church, and week two, and no one came the second week. We had, Kira, again, prepared snacks, and we ate them, and I did another discussion to Kira. For two weeks, you know what's more awkward than no one turning up for two weeks? It's on the third week when one person turns up. And then you're making, making mis- like excuses for all the fake people that don't come to your group, and you tell, oh, man, everyone's busy, you know, it's the time of year. We got so fed up with church folk, we decided to invite our neighbours, so I went to my neighbors, we had a little duplex, we we're in like this little duplex community. I went down to every neighbor, I invited them, they started coming. We had this one particular set of neighbors who came to Bible study group, right? They came to our group, they came along and she walked in and she had a limp. She had like this brace on her knee and I'm like, oh man, is everything okay? And she's like, oh, it's just an athletic injury. You know, she kind of dismissed it and she just came into group. And I thought, this is my moment. You know what? I'm going to stop. I'm not going to do my discussion I've already done for two weeks now. I'm, I'm actually going to do a brand new discussion tonight. I'm I'm going to preach on the healing power of Jesus. This is what I had in my mind. We have got a candidate for the healing power of Jesus. I'm going to preach, then I'm going to pray. We're going to have a miracle and we're going to have an overflowing revival group. And so I went for it. I preached on the healing power of Jesus. It was good too. It was raw. It was off the cuff, but it was good. And at the end of it, I, I was so hyped up. I said, does anybody need prayer? And it was crickets. I'm looking around the group. I'm like, does anybody for anything maybe need a healing? Crickets. Everyone's looking around. Everyone's looking at this girl with the knee brace. So I went specific and kind of made a word of knowledge. I said, I I feel maybe someone has a knee issue. (laughs) I'm trying to make it obvious. Looking around. I'm like, I just said, hey, can we pray for your knee? And she goes, oh, this? I said, yeah, like, well, let's, I know the athletic injury. Let's, let's pray for it. She goes, oh, no, it's, it's okay. This is my cross to bear. I went, excuse me? She said, yeah, no, if, if Jesus wanted me healed, he'd heal me. Now, obviously, that sent me into a deep theological discourse with her. But, but needless to say, I said, oh, sweetheart, if that was your cross to bear, I hate to tell you, bearing the cross of Jesus Christ is way more than that. I want to make sure I tell you, Vibe Church, if you're going to bear the cross of Jesus Christ, if you're going to carry your cross, it's not as convenient as an ailment. Because with an ailment, I can still walk. See, if you've got an ailment or an asthma or some condition, I'm not going to stand by and let you say, well, this is my cross to bear. That is not God's idea when He says, carry your cross. And before you get too excited, it's way heavier. It's way heavier. In fact, maybe we could start the year. I could help you. Because I think it would be helpful to kick off our year with some honest assessment of what it actually takes to be a true disciple of Jesus. 
I didn't come to play this year. I came to pick a fight. Not with you, with the devil, by the way. Okay, you're on my side. It's us together. Let us pick a fight. But I came to pick a fight with the devil because really as a pastor of this church across the globe, I want to make sure I'm developing soldiers that are committed to advancing his kingdom. And there are so many goals flying around at the beginning of the new year. I would hate to give my best efforts to something this year to find out at the end of the year it fell short from anything significant. Wow. Truthfully, above every other goal that you could possibly put on your moleskin pad this year, I would say the goal of being a true disciple should be right up there at the top. Yeah. How does this year, 2024, be the year where I deepen my discipleship, where I discover how to become a true disciple of Jesus? And believe it or not, this passage of Scripture This is the context of what Jesus is talking about. You see, in Matthew chapter 16, we have a significant chapter of the Bible because it holds possibly one of the most pivotal moments of revealed revelation or recorded revelation in Scripture. It's in Matthew chapter 16 where we find Jesus. And He's talking to the disciples. And as He's talking to the disciples, He asks them what seems like an out-of-context question. He just drops it on them mid-conversation. And He says, hey, who do people say that I am? Just casual like. And the disciples are, are kind of scrambling. They, they kind of scramble to say what they've heard. The rumors that they've witnessed going around, what people have muttered in, in the healing moments and in the different moments where they've seen minister, Jesus minister, what the gossip was. And they, they, begin to, they begin to spout what people say. Now you've got to understand this. Please do not get this wrong. Do not misunderstand what Jesus was doing. Jesus was not concerned about his public reputation. What he was trying to do is he was trying to zero in on what the disciples knew, what they understood. Because up until this point, the disciples had only referred to Jesus as rabbi, teacher. And so, and so what Jesus need, needed them to do was to understand exactly who he is. And so what he does is he then goes from saying, what do people say that I am, to saying, who do you say that I am? Yeah. And in a, what we can suggest is a rare moment of brilliance from Peter. How many people feel like Peter a lot of the time? Like, like you hardly have a moment of brilliance, but when it's good, it's good. <laughs> well, well, this is Peter. Peter, in just this bizarre, no one expected it come from Peter, but in this moment, Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And it literally stops time. This moment where he revealed the first human to speak out that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. It was so monumental. It literally was, and it cannot be overemphasized how pivotal this moment was in the ministry of Jesus because from this moment forward, he could begin to reveal his very mission on earth. The very reason he stepped out of heaven and stepped onto earth could now be revealed because he was in the witness of his disciples. And he goes on to say this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed And on the third day, be raised to life. Check this out. Peter took him aside. Remember, he just had a moment of brilliance. Took him aside and began to rebuke him. That's what confidence will, that's what overconfidence will do. Could you imagine just like getting a win and then being like, hey, Jesus. He says, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Get behind me, not Peter, Satan. Now, while this could seem like a severe overreaction from Jesus, (laughs) what Jesus was doing was actually confronting something extremely cancerous to our Christianity, which is preservation. Peter was trying to prevent Jesus from dying. He, I'm sure his motives were noble. No, 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 Lord, not on my watch. But he missed in that moment what the Messiah had come to do. Jesus had just revealed now that you recognize me as the Messiah, I must now go to die 
this is the cost for me to be the Messiah. And Peter says, no, because he was focused on preservation. Now, uh, if, you, if you happen to grow up in a church setting, if you happen to kind of be around for a while, especially if you were in the church during the 90s, th- there was, a, there was a, a doctrine that was circulating around America in the 90s called a prosperity doctrine. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? You've been around for a minute. If you're new to church, good for you. You don't need to know about any of this. But, but back then, there was this particular kind of doctrine that floated around called the prosperity doctrine that, that, that really was focused only and solely on the blessings that come with a life with Christ. It was, it was focused on the benefits that come with a life with Christ alone. Now, while it is true that God has got a plan to prosper, you know, we know Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, we, we, while, while, while God has made you an overcomer, I do need to make sure you're aware that that victory comes at a cost. Yeah. That there is a price to pay for following Jesus. There is a cost that comes with the calling. And this is what Jesus is revealing to his disciples. Jesus is preparing them and he's revealing to them what the cost was not only going to be for him, but for anyone who wants to be a true disciple. Trust me, this sermon's going to get way more encouraging. I, I feel like I've lost you right from the first Sunday of the year. Don't worry, I've got to take you somewhere. I, I'm more interested in who you're going to be at the end of this year than the end of today. I'm going to build you over this year to, to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. I want to make you militant in your faith. I don't want you to have a casual, complacent Christianity this year. I don't want you to come to Christ and add church into your life like a convenient element to your life. I want you to pursue Jesus with everything. In fact, let's, let's just go back to our series scripture because Jesus literally spells it out what it costs to, follow, to, follow, to be a follower of him. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Okay, so check this out. Jesus starts with whoever wants to be my disciple. That is so important. What do you want? Do you want this? Or, is, or do you feel like you have to do this? Do you want this? Sometimes for those that grew up in the church and you're surrounded by church, your parents went to church, your grandparents went to church and you find yourself in church, there's gotta be a point where you realize, I want this. It can't be just a residual proximity anointing that comes with salvation. No, 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 I, I, I gotta want it for myself. And Jesus literally offers it out there. Do you want this? I'm talking, to, I'm talking to husbands that got married to wives and you didn't know Christ before you married her, but now she's a part of church and you're tagging along, but do you want this? Your wife don't get you into heaven. Your wife doesn't, her, the grace that's for her is for her, not for you. God's got grace for you, but do you want this? There's got to be, a, Jesus is putting it out there like, I ain't going to force it on you. I will compel you by grace, but, but, but do you want it? But for anybody who wants it, he says, if you want this, what I have to offer, then you have to deny yourself. Now, I find this an interesting phrase because it actually holds, within this phrase, deny yourself, it holds the very key to understanding the cost of following Christ. Once you have assessed the value of something and decided that you actually want it, it's a pretty good idea to consider if you're prepared to pay what it costs. So Jesus says, to be my disciple, one must deny themselves. All right, let's do something this morning. Let's break this down. I wanna wanna literally unpack what it means to deny oneself because it might not be so obvious. You see, it would be a mistake to think that denying yourself is in the realm of self-esteem. That like somehow that denying yourself is being so humble that you say, oh, I'm I'm literally nothing. Uh, I'm nobody. That's not me. I've heard heard preachers do that. When when some of my buddies have gone to encourage them, I said, man, that was a great word. Like, oh, no, no, it wasn't me. It was all God. I'm like, wasn't that good, okay? (laughs) If it was all God, it would have been way better. (laughs) Um, It was actually pretty average, but I'm complimenting you because it was you. (laughs) In the context of you, it was great. In the context of Jesus, it could have been better, but 
But that's how we think it is, to deny myself. No, 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 not me, not me, no, no, no. But that's, that's actually not what Jesus is called to do. Do you know what humility is? It's a, it's a true estimation of oneself. And when I actually have a true estimation of myself, I see that all that Christ has done in my life and I'm, I'm an overcomer, that I'm more than victorious in Him, that I'm a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And, and that's actually would be a true estimation of myself. If someone says, how are you? I'm, saying, I'm victorious because I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I'm an overcomer. That would be actually a true estimation of myself. Because throughout his word, Jesus is constantly trying to build up our identity. Let me give you a scripture to start the year. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What about Galatians 3.26? It says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all God, children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have now closed yourself with Christ. This would be a good time to write down in your brand new moleskin alongside your goals for the year, some scriptures about your identity in Christ. What about 1 Corinthians 6, 19 that says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Likewise, 1 John chapter 3 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And what is it that, and, and, and sorry, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. You see, Jesus' plan is to build confidence within us as those who identify with Christ. So denying yourself is not dismissing yourself. That's not denying yourself. So what we do need to do then is understand what does it mean to deny ourselves. And to do that, we need to identify what gratifies ourself. In other words, we need to zero in on all the things that we hold on to that I could possibly consider as qualifications for His grace. Now, now I know you're thinking I don't do that, but if your Christianity is anything but hot, if your walk with God is at some level lukewarm, if there is a casual element to your Christianity, I dare say you're still holding on to some qualifications by your measure that would warrant you as a recipient of God's grace. Let me, let me show you with the Apostle Paul. Before you turn on me and you feel like I'm picking a fight with you, I'm not picking a fight with you. I'm picking a fight with the devil through you. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. But let me go, just go with me for a second and, and, and go with me in Oakland. Go with me. With, I wanna show you something from the Apostle Paul in Philippians. He, he writes with this in mind to the Philippian church because he sees it so important for the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, to understand this. He, he writes this with this premise in mind, addressing some of these notions. He says in Philippians 3.3, 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though, check this out, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reasons, reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Check this out. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. What the apostle does here is he presents a list of what his qualifiers are. What would earn him righteousness? I need some help with this sermon. Youth Pastor Ben, could you come up here? Come on, can we welcome up Youth Pastor Ben? I need some help with this because in the natural, we see the Apostle Paul and he holds out a list, elements of what he considers as qualifiers. He, 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 it's his achievements. It's his accolades. And he holds them out as his reason for self-confidence. He's like, if anybody had confidence in the flesh, the self, he says, I could. And he begins to list them like these little elements. He says, 
Yep, circumcised on the eighth day. What a flex. What a flex. I don't even know Hebrew culture that well to know if that is a flex, but on the eighth day, not the ninth, Rob, on the eighth, he adds, ooh, he adds to it uh, Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, oh, let's get this one. He says, tribe of Benjamin. That's very fitting, Benjamin. <laughs> he, he says, as for, for passion, a zealot. He, he says, uh, Pharisee of Pharisees. He's just listing all these things and he's holding them out there like he's like flexing on people. He, he, he says, uh, zealous, I was a persecutor of the church. And what we see him is he starts to just hold all these things. You know, he, he talks about, he, he studied under the great Gamaliel. Like that, that's like the best of the best. Like if he's, he's an educated person. I mean, you went to school, but I went to, I went to Stanford. That's kind of what he's saying. Like he's, he's showing all of, his, all of his quals and he's holding them. Can you do any more? Like, like cause he's, he's a gifted guy. So he's got a lot going going on, the, the apostle, and, and I'm sure that when you start to list it out, it looks pretty impressive when he's holding all these things. <clears throat> come on, we can get one more attribute in there. Oh no, we can get more attributes. No, come on, Ben, do a better job. You're the apostle Paul. Come on, come on, Ben. All right, it's hard, I know, to juggle all these attributes. Stay still, Ben. What are you doing? All right, hold it. No, let's put this one. Where? Oh, right there. That's not going to work. Yes. Yes, there's a finger. There you go. Let's hold this one. Six days into a fast. Just flex, just hold. This is what we look like. This is what we look like. This is what we look like when we're holding all our qualifications, all our confidences, all our reasons. Looks ridiculous. And here lies the danger. The danger comes when we see Jesus as another addition. That's what we do. Make a little margin for Jesus. Like I've got all these things going on, but you know what, I'm gonna add Jesus just casually into that little pocket, kind of like a little added benefit. Like I'm adding Jesus like an added element, but you misunderstand the formula for faith. The formula for faith is not addition, it's subtraction. Go with me. The formula for faith is not addition. Philippians, Paul goes on to say, but whatever I gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You see, you thought Jesus was another addition alongside your circumcised on the eighth day, alongside your own accolades, alongside your degrees, alongside your goodness, alongside your good behavior. You thought that Jesus was a little addition. But I hate to tell you what Paul said. He, he said, when I looked at everything I held out, I considered it rubbish compared to the surpassing worth. So I'm afraid to tell you this ball doesn't do it justice. Can I please get a Jesus-sized ball out here? Bring out my, because if we're going to actually do this illustration right, I need to put in comparison to all your accolades what it would be like to try and add Jesus into the mix. See, see, this is your degree. This is your status. This is your confidence. This is your awards. This is Jesus. What Jesus has to offer is way more than what you can hold. And I hate to tell it if you try and add Jesus, it's not going to work. Ben, I want you to try and grab hold of Jesus for a moment. You see, to grab Jesus, I have to let go of everything else. And it requires me taking hold of it with both hands. With both hands. I can't hold everything and hold Jesus. It's an either or. It's an either or. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Give it up for... Use Pastor Ben. See, Paul goes on to say, as he held out all his self-security in comparison to Christ, he says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. 
the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You can't, you can't hold your stuff and take hold of Jesus. You can't hold your stuff and take hold of Jesus. It requires you denying that stuff and with both hands grabbing hold of Jesus. The reason Jesus says to deny yourself is because he's got way more for you. <laughs> what he's got is more. You're just trying to add Jesus into the little crevices and corners that you've got spare for Jesus. See, Jesus, I got Sunday spare. Can you fit in there? Oh, help me preach like this is a real church of Jesus Christ. You didn't come to a Presbyterian church today. You came to a Pentecostal, Holy Spirit-filled church. Here you are trying to just be all quiet, add Jesus into the corner in the crevice of your life. That's not how it works, folks. Jesus is an all-consuming fire. And He says you must deny yourself and follow Me. You must deny yourself and take hold with both hands. With both hands. Huh. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Once you deny yourself, then you can take up your cross. Because it needs both hands. Once you deny yourself, then you can take up. Well, what does it mean to take up your cross? You see, it's interesting to view this conversation between Jesus and the disciples from, a, from our vantage point in our modern setting as we look back over Scripture and we see from the other side of the cross. For us, the symbol of the cross is victory. That's why you have a cross hanging around your neck. That's why you have a cross in your car, wherever you have your cross, because it's a position and a reminder of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. But at the moment of this discussion, it wasn't a symbol of victory. It was a symbol of torture. All the disciples knew about the cross was the cross that they saw criminals take the, cru the cross on their way to their crucifixion. It was a common day setting that someone by the Roman government who would be killed, they would be sentenced to crucifixion. They would have to carry their own cross up the streets, exposing them to ridicule, exposing them to shame from the people who would watch them and call them a criminal. And they would jeer at them and they would cheer at them. And this was the punishment. That was part of the punishment. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, you have to carry your cross. You have to carry your cross. You have to carry your cross. You don't just have to get crucified. You have to carry your cross. Jesus didn't say, you wanna be my follower, be crucified. He said, carry your cross. Because the process of carrying your cross is never done in convenience. The process of carrying your cross is public. It's not private. You can't sneak your cross under a shirt. You can't sneak your cross away from the workplace. You can't sneak your cross away from your family. It is public to everybody when someone is a carrier of their cross. It cannot be hidden. It cannot be tucked away. It cannot be marginalized out to a part of your life. <laughs> can't be private. I've been doing, I've been doing some some shooting lately. I got a rifle last year and I've been doing marksmanship. I'm training for something. I don't know what, but I'm training. And I've been getting pretty good. So I've been, you know, researching different ways to get better. And, and for some reason, my, my feed is now, like my Instagram feed, my social media feeds are all these advertisements on how I can get my concealed carry permit. And it sounds very attractive to me. Don't worry, I'm looking into it. But, 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 but outside of that, that stuff, the reality is I was realizing as I was looking at the concealed carry permit, I realized that the cross you cannot conceal. There's no concealed carry for the cross. There's no way you can hide the cross. There's no nice little shirt that you can get or a belt or whatever that you can tuck your cross away. It's public to everybody. It's obvious. That's what Jesus was saying. If you wanna be my follower, you can't do it in private. You want to follow me, you can't do it in secret. You want to follow me, I'm going to put a big cross on your shoulder that everyone who sees you sees. There's a Christian, there's a follower of Jesus. He's carrying his cross. It's what it takes. Can't do it casually, can't do it quietly. 
having died to this old life, I'm sold out completely. I'm sold out. There's no turning back. Why, why do you have to be sold out? Because there's a price to pay. I can't preserve this thing. This ain't about preserving my life. I have to spend my life. That's the call to follow Jesus. It's a life spent in service for Him. It's so, so oh, 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 Pastor, it's really inconvenient when it rains to get our kids out and come to the house of God. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm spending my life. So a little bit of rain ain't gonna get in my way. If a little bit of rain can stop me from getting to the house of God and worshiping with the fellow believers, I better recheck my cross. I better go and find where I left my cross because I got my raincoat on, but I forgot my cross. Oh, Pastor, my, my workplace, they don't allow us to profess our faith. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to find a new job because you cannot take your cross from me. And if you want me at this workplace, Christ comes with me. I ain't trying to build a mega church. I'm trying to build a mega army, army of saints who want to move the kingdom of God forward all across the globe. I've decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. There's no turning back. There is no amount of life that I can preserve just in case. Because while I'm holding on to anything, I haven't got a grip on Jesus. While I'm holding on to anything, I can't grab a hold of all the things that God has for me. And maybe the tension that you're feeling in your walk with God actually comes from the fact that you're still trying to hold on to that stuff and grab hold of Jesus when it takes a two-hand hold. It takes a two-hand hold. But we're trying to hold on to some of our stuff and say, God, I want to add you. I want to add you. I want to add you. God says, I don't want you to add me. I want to be your everything. I want you to abandon your security and the things that you call a qualifier. And I want you to put your trust wholly and solely on me.